since this uh, coronavirus came, what have been your interaction with um, uh, the the people that you previously worked with when you came on the on the continent? Um, so, um, as I stated before, we've been working with helping to improve the perioperative um, system mm -hmm. in Sierra Leone since about 2010, working to improve um, things like anesthesia equipment availability. And um, in uh, our last uh, trip to Sierra Leone was in 2018, where we brought a large team of about 24 students and faculty, um, CEOs and others to Freetown, uh, Sierra Leone for training in mechanical ventilation in the operating room for nurse anesthetists, and also mm -hmm. simulation based training uh, of physicians for critical care medicine in the ICU. Um, so this was a, a specific unique training program that we presented uh, using simulation mannequins um, to drill uh, the, the trainees on how to actually manage different uh, situations with a mechanical ventilator. So when the COVID thing uh, took place, we got contacted um, by representatives of the president of Leone to actually uh, engage in uh, training to get a larger number of their physicians and nurses up to speed on how to do mechanization for a COVID patient because they were seeing that this is something that is going to be a problem in their country. So at the same time as they were working with us, they actually contacted a company called Gradient Health of New York City, which specifically makes anesthesia and critical care equipment will function in the African environment. We know that uh, in a lot of African countries, um, they have challenges with availability of compressed oxygen, especially in the rural environments, but in some places also in the urban environment. And so uh, this particular mechanical ventilator can work on a variety of different oxygen inputs, including a concentrator literally to plug into the wall and it changes air into oxygen. Our ventilators that we have at here at Johns Hopkins can't do that. If you don't have high grade compressed oxygen from the wall, our ventilators will just turn off. And I've actually been in situations in Eritrea, for example, where we've had a patient on a ventilator and the oxygen has just turned itself off because it ran, ran dry and the ventilator just failed and the patient actually expired um, in the intensive care unit. So it's very important to have a ventilator that has these capabilities. The other capability these ventilators have is that they um, have up to a 12 hour battery life. So literally the power out for 12 hours before the, the ventilator will, will stop working. The ventilators that we have here in the United States by and large, the power goes out, the ventilator stops immediately. So uh, these robust, low maintenance ventilators are really tailored for the African environment. And um, we're so um, actually proud to see that the president of Sierra Leone had that type of foresight to act, uh, it, it, I'm assuming it's him, it came from his office, had the foresight to actually see that they needed to improve these resources um, and I not just get the, the device, not just get devices. I mean, we have leaders here in the United States who are just focused devices. We just need lots of ventilators, 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 but not talking about who's going to run those ventilators, to manage the patients in those ventilators, who's going to operate them correctly. Because if you don't operate them correctly, especially on a COVID patient, that patient will die from the leader itself being mismanaged. And so uh, we actually were able to um, quickly, very, very rapidly utilize some of the educational resources that we did during previous trips to both Sierra Leone and Nigeria, where we also have a project at Lagos University Teaching Hospital, and utilize some of those resources to create an online 
Zoom guided medical simulation yeah. program mm -hmm. for Sierra Leone doctors and nurses. And we actually had it set up. We, we've been doing this every single weekend for the last four weekends. Every weekend we have a, a room set up where we have the same ventilator in that room that they have. We have the same simulation that they have with the same artificial lung that is capable of breathing on its own that they have. They're in Sierra Leone in Freetown at the 34 military hospital with some of the people who we've trained to facilitate this in the past. And they are distancing with masks while they're in the room but also with our if our uh, you know video projected on a large screen so that all of them can actually we can actually train them interactively not just a bunch uh -huh. of dry lectures they're literally operating the ventilator during our training program they're literally going through skills with our training program and they're ending uh, the entire saturday in the entire Doing, we've been training every weekend, including Easter weekend, Easter weekend, Easter Sunday. The Sierra Leone team and the American team were there uh, in the room, just training, 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 because we know that what we teach them, whatever we train them for, whatever we can help them do, will actually be potentially be implemented on a patient. And whether the patient can be managed correctly or not may be specific in it upon how effective we've been able to do our program uh, with them uh, via Zoom between Maryland and Freetown, Sierra Leone. Okay, and this is so something that you replicated in other countries. And this is something that we're putting into an online form so that even if someone doesn't want to use this on a live version, they could actually go to the website and access from any African country this 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 uh, platform for training on how to manage mechanical ventilation for a COVID patient. Okay, so um, in in hearing you talk about the ventilator and the role that it plays with treating COVID nineteen, I was looking at the numbers. United States. Um, the percentage of confirmed cases that die is 5.8% currently. And the world average is 6.9. That tells me that the United States focus on using a uh, ventilator to treat COVID-19 might be working a little better than the, the world average. At the same time, when you look at Africa, our percentage, the percentage of death of, um, versus the number of confirmed cases are actually much lower than even the United States and that of the world. So in light of that, do you think that, one, the treatment that came from Madagascar, which is not heavily focused on the use of ventilator, and the traditional herbal methods that right now everybody is having to use here in Africa, which works better, in your opinion? So, um, so mixing a little bit of apples and oranges. Number okay. one, uh, the the there was a point in time where oh. they, where China was overrun with COVID patients and deaths, but there were none in oh. Italy, and there were none in okay. the United States. Then there was another point of okay. time where Italy was overrun, over overrun. And, and President Trump was bragging that there were only five COVID patients in the United States. And now we're at another point of time where the United States has the number, you know, more COVID deaths and patients than any other country in the world. And Africa doesn't have as many. So we're, we're looking at different locations that are different phases of where the curve of COVID patients is. The other okay. thing we're not taking into consideration is that 
the populations aren't the same. The average age of an American is not the average age of a Ghanaian. All right. Uh -huh. And and yeah. and though we have we have many young, actually they're looking at even this week they're looking at pediatric children who have been getting on ventilators and some have died from COVID, but the percentage of them are low. Still, you have to remember that out of the United States, even you talk about statistics, oh, it's just a percent, it's over 6%. No, look, we right now, we have almost 70,000 human beings dead. And that's probably undercounting because if you die, and you didn't get to the hospital and you didn't get tested, then they don't count your death, COVID death. So that 70,000 right. may be a lot more than that, all right? And right. so then that also affects the validity of those statistics, all right? And uh, right now, the governor of Florida, for example, encouraging um, nursing homes not to necessarily report COVID death that are and so, so just there were some issues uh, regarding um, the statistics in China. There's also some issues regarding st the statistics and how they are being in the states as well. And so, uh, so remember that the other, the other to 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 just keep in mind is that the brain trust of Africa, the brain trust and the leadership of Africa tends to be the older people. People. So you don't want to lose that brain trust of older people, of people who are accomplished, entrepreneurs, businessmen. You don't want to lose that brain trust be because they're in the minority of the number of people who are going to, to die from the COVID. So when we okay. get into the issue of different types of treatments, we've already seen mm -hmm. where the President of the United States has gone off on a that this hydroxyquin, you know, that's the key. That's the key. That's the cure. And yet we have studies now because he's not looking at those studies that have shown that in in mo multiple locations where hydroxychloroquine has been studied, about there was about a percent mortality death rate of the people who got that particular treatment. So now, when when if you're going to ask me. Uh, you know, from a scientific background, biology major, uh, physician, you know, to give an assessment as to what is the impact of completely unstudied or herbal uh, treatments, which guaranteed herbs that are in Mozambique, I can guarantee you they ain't the same herbs that are present in Gambia. All right. The herbs that are present in Sudan in an arid location in Sudan, which I was in just a couple years ago, are totally, totally different from wet, lush oh, yeah. location in Sierra Leone. And so I don't know, I can't reconcile it. I can't tell you that they don't work. I can't oh, tell well, you that they do I work. You can say that they haven't yeah, been studied. And, 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 yeah. and so we don't know. There's no, there's no scientific or, whatever you want to call it, evaluation that's, that's been done that can give any kind of conclusion. All it can be is wishing, uh, wish, wish, wishful thinking, just like, you know, our own pad about hydroxychloroquine, wishful thinking. So I, I would prefer not to deal with wishful thinking, uh, you know, because I deal with, you know, basically statistics and facts and, and what, what is the real deal. I, I want to be Hello. honest. You know, there are many things that have been said about this COVID thing lack honesty, and but I, but I want honesty to be coming out of my mouth. That's good. Okay. Anyway, those doctors in Madagascar would disagree. That is uh, wishful thinking. I'm sure there are a lot of tests that went behind before they they put it forward. But having said that, let's focus on your your uh, the uh, the equipment that you're bringing to court. How if 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 they are needed in a large quantity, are you able to supply them in large quantity to African governments? I don't supply the equipment. 
The equipment okay. was not donated and given. It was the okay. government of Sierra Leone decided uh -huh. that out of the resources that they had, that they wanted mm. to actually invest to their healthcare system to get this particular equipment. So they're purchasing the equipment. And it's actually the company that they're purchasing the equipment from is actually leveraging its resources to even sponsor my team. So, uh, okay, so, so, so I don't have readers or, or, or ventilators or anything like that to, to just give. Okay. You know, all of these countries are actually getting uh, funding related to COVID, and there's no book uh, for COVID. Uh, maybe, hopefully, that what what they're come up with in Madagascar will pan out, and it'll, it'll everybody from, from COVID. But right now, um, there's no conclusion that there is any type of a cure for COVID. And so uh, no. there's no way to prevent it. And so only thing you can do is support the patient until the immune system can clear it and, and, and hopefully it can clear it before it kills them. And so that supportive care for a percentage of people requires them to actually help to be on life support to be breathing. And without that life support, then that whole segment of people will guarantee die because your international traditions are not the same now. And so whereas, whereas in the past, a person of wealth or means could say, I really don't care about investing into my country's healthcare system because I have access to just get on a plane and I'll fly over to England, I'll fly over to France, I'll fly over to the United States, I'll fly over to South Africa, I will get treatment outside of the country. Now, what? those individuals need to be concerned about having those resources yeah, in yes. their country. They may not be yeah. able to act and it may not be able to flight in time for them to survive if they really get sick from okay. this condition. See, that's where, that's where I was going to with a question because right now there's a renewed sense that we need to build our capacity, uh, our capacity here on the mm -hmm. continent. That right. is why I was asking that, given your description, that those particular ventilators that you describe are better suited on the continent. It seems to right. me that mm -hmm. if some, somebody is listening to this interview and he's a decision maker mm -hmm. somewhere on the continent of Africa, they're going to want to know more about it. Where do they go to find out this information? Um, so, uh, so basically, um, there's several, I guess there's a different sources. One, uh, the company that, that sell, sells these particular brand of ventilators is called Gradient Health. Um, so they have a website. Um, they can also, uh, Contact uh, contact me through either LinkedIn or the Institute of Global Perioperative Care uh, website. Either one of those, um, or they could even send you a note, and then you could actually refer them to me as well. So, and then I can actually direct them to whatever resources that are available. The Africa Union is also, uh, and the ECOWAS are also doing activities uh, really to uh, trying to improve the availability of this equipment. Um, so, um, uh, so, th so there's potentially other resources that we can also direct them to as well. Oh, very good. Finally, mm -hmm. um, as Africa seeks to boost its uh, healthcare infrastructure, where do you see uh, perioperative in this process? So. Um, so the WHO is a leading world organization that ministers of health, healthers look to for guidance. Mm -hmm. Up until recently, and even as of now, the WHO has actually one main person, one person that's involved for all perioperative issues globally. Anything related to sur surgery, anesthesia, one person globally. And so uh, because of that, uh, the message has been sort of like assumed that this is 
is not is is beyond the capabilities of these countries or or it's not a priority or you know the wealth fly out you know why not those systems for others or something um so you have you know eritrea has zero anesthesiology physicians. you have, have very few students, liberia uh, zero. They have some newly uh, trained uh, physicians who got at least one year of training in Liberia, so they have that. Liberia, Sierra Leone has two, and and countries throughout the whole continent have a uh, uh, ratio of surgeons and anesthesia and uh, and healthcare providers involved with the perioperative process, and so um, so uh, that we're trying to raise awareness of that. We're trying to work with other organizations to collaborate with us to raise awareness of that, and we're, um, we're, we're go-getters go, 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 go and go-do-it people. So we're literally doing projects and programs with locations even during COVID, and when COVID, we'll go back to uh, traveling to different countries to actually do in-person projects like we were before. But um, but uh, countries now are, are, at least some of the countries are realizing the resources that they didn't have that would have benefited them to develop prior to this uh, COVID outbreak. And I think that it was helpful, helpful to these countries and the, the, the healthcare leaders to actually see the United States go through some pain to see the United States and Italy, these countries that have supposedly vast healthcare resources, have many intensive care units and many ventilators struggling to actually have enough healthcare providers, ventilators and resources to meet the needs of the patients, but not giving up and letting patients die, struggling and fighting even with their own governments to and get the resources where it to be to help save as many people as possible. Imagine how powerful that message is to locations that didn't allocate a very large proportion of their national GDP towards the development of any related to an ICU or a ventilator or a, or a surgeon or, or an anesthesiologist. It gives them a message they need to improve. Okay. All right, Dr. Samson, I thank you. I looked in the crystal ball and I see you retiring in Africa. Am I wrong? Yes, that would be, that's my, <laughs> definitely <laughs> my goal. <laughs> so you're not retiring in Africa? Eventually, retire in about 10 years or so, then that would be my goal. Mm -hmm. All right, very good. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. For your time and you've been great all right thank you all right it was a pleasure um, thank you very much <laughs>